thanks for everyone for joining. Um, great turnout. I think security is probably a big topic as we start moving into container world. Um, I guess for those of you that haven't met me, I think I've seen a lot of familiar faces. My name is Michael Dielman. Um, I'm with a company called Twistlock. Um, we're in the cybersecurity and compliance space, specifically around CNCF and containers. Um, before that, I was at a company called Docker for about three years, and, and now I'm uh, heading up things in this realm of the world. Ich kann ein bisschen auf Deutsch, but I'm not a native speaker, so I'm going to do it in English today. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so I guess just a little bit about the talk and framing. What we're going to introduce is kind of some of, the, some of the benefits that you get from moving to a containerized realm. And I think the idea is, and I'm just going to put a little bit of caveat up front, is that this is kind of targeted at more of a, I'd say, beginner plus type of audience, meaning that you've done something with containers. Maybe you haven't um, you know, gone into full-fledged production. Maybe you aren't orchestrating at scale. But what we want to do is highlight some of the inherent benefits that come from operating in that context, um, and then um, things that you can take advantage of now and that are going to free up time and mental energy so that you can go do other things. Um, big theme of, of a lot of the talks today, so it's going to be right in line with that. Um, I will warn you, if you are expecting CLI uh, action today, I don't have it. So if you are expecting that, then probably other talks here, but uh, I think you'll hopefully still come away with a couple points, uh, you know, convey some new ideas about how to think about security, how you build that into your workflows, um, and so I think there's still some valuable uh, gems that you can find. So um, I guess just a look at a little bit about Twistlock itself. Um, we've been around for three years. Um, I guess a lot, of it, a lot of the stuff in this area has been around for three years <laughs> or so. Um, and, um, and it gives us a lot of experience uh, in seeing how this whole cloud native um, ecosystem, a lot of those projects that you guys yourselves have, have either participated in in some way, making a pull request or code contribution, how this has evolved. And with that, kind of a new set of challenges has emerged. And as new sets of challenges emerge, or you know, what I like to say is that complexity is never really destroyed, right? Things never get simplified. The complexity is just shifted one way or the other. And uh, the same thing is uh, pretty much true as it, as it relates to security. But there's some concepts that we can apply from you know, the realm of containers, things like declarative programming that also apply in that realm. So we'll go into that. Um, but we've been around for three years. Um, we've got offices in Israel, as many of the uh, security guys do. That's a strange correlation. <laughs> and uh, and um, uh, yeah, we'll hop into it. So just a look at the agenda. Um, we're going to talk about this thing, lift and shift. Um, kind of an overblown term at this point. You've probably seen the build, ship, run. The next is that is, you know, how do I lift and shift my apps from one place to another? You know, we'll kind of try to put some boundaries on that so that I don't see everyone's eyes roll in the back of their head and fall asleep. Um, and then we're, we're going to dive into, uh, after that framing, into a specific client example. And um, the idea is to say, okay, well, specifically in the context of security, what are some of these concepts that I can go apply regardless of my state of maturity? So, lift and shift, just putting a little bit of framing around it. Um, like I said, overblown marketing term. Um, the idea is, you know, really simple, right? How do I change the packaging of my application to make my life easier, right? How do I take the benefits of a declarative programming model, of um, putting only the bare minimal things that this particular application needs to run in that box and move that box from point A to point B and have it be unpackaged equally, right? With that comes all of the operational benefits that are the main reason that organizations start to um, invest in cloud native technologies, containers, whatnot, right? So we also see some adoption patterns as we go through this. And I think we, if you, anyone sat in the last talk, um, you know, I won't go into tons of detail, but um, obviously improvements of automation and efficiency. Um, as you go in, you're also going to see, um, this is things like, OK, I have consistent builds. We solve that it works on my machine. Um, you know, as we, as we go through that stage, right, CI, CD is kind of the first step of that. And then the operational piece of that is another thing, right? And this is where we start to think about real life conditions. This is the edge cases um, of, of dealing with an application as I bring in layers like orchestration, right? Um, that abstraction is um, 
you know, double-edged sword. In some ways, it makes my life much easier. In some ways, it makes my life much more complicated. Once again, this complexity is being shifted um, in the pipeline in different ways. Um, it's creating a different set of challenges. But the important thing, you know, as we see organizations kind of move past that first step in CI is then to say, okay, well, I need to take this application um, and actually have some stakes around it, right? This means that this is an application maybe running in the context of you know, a service that internal teams are using on a daily basis. Maybe it's touching our revenue stream. Um, regardless of that, um, that's kind of the human motivator to actually uh, apply a different set of thinking in terms of just you know, setting up Hello World on you know, a Docker box on, on my local system, right? So um, then what we see is kind of this, OK, well, I've got an application. I want to take this into production, or I have taken it into production, security. Um, and we kind of see that model as being, you know, contrary to a lot of the philosophies that come into this idea of DevOps, right? The whole idea of DevOps is that, you know, we're going to have continuous iterating improvement. Well, the, the thing that we see is, 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 okay, CI, CD, deployment to production, and then what about, right? What about security? What about compliance? And so maybe just to get a show of hands, how many folks have applications that are Dockerized or Kubernetesized and running in prod today? Okay, so like the vast majority of you guys. Uh, how many of those same group of hands have like compliance, you know, whether it's GDPR, PCI, DSS, and you know, different ISO standards that you need to comply for that particular application? Okay, so maybe about like, let's say half of those. And then of those, how many have put in measures at this stage, you know, when the first release there were measures in place for security? Okay, so decent percentage, right? Yeah, and so the way we look at, at twist lock uh, at security is, is, you know, we think about shifting left and this iterative approach. We think that security also needs to integrate and iterate at the same pace as your code development, right? Um, and I'll go into some of the challenges about that as well. But that's a fundamental shift, right? If we're going to shift application responsibility left, then there's also a component of that that's actually developer-owned security. And in order for developers to do a good job of doing security, which they generally do want to do, right? No one likes getting a nasty email from the ops guy that, like, or the security or the compliance guy that's like, no, right? And I can understand how that, in some ways, that's very satisfying to tell a developer no. <laughs> but it doesn't really help us release the code software, um, code faster. And, and that's a big problem, right? The whole reason we adopt these methodologies is to go faster. So what are some of the challenges? And that's bright. Um, <laughs> if you, you know, the sun's not out, so we're getting our tan this way. <laughs> um, so what's different about securing containers? We all know we're going from um, you know, hundreds of VMs to tens of thousands of containers. Um, we're introducing multiple abstractions, especially in the context of networking or orchestration, things like Kubernetes, et cetera. And now, once again, trade-off. Good thing, we have complexity. We solve complexity with abstraction. Bad thing. We've put things in a black box and we lose visibility, right? Um, we have a high rate of change, um, and the w rate at, at which we're releasing code and actually letting the code live in the wild is more ephemeral. What does that mean? That means our traditional runbook models, this kind of scan once type of um, either compliance model or security model, doesn't really apply. Um, because it requires human action to update, right? Anytime a new app or a new version of that app is pushed, you know, how are we going to go back and check and understand if that model matches, you know, the actual application behavior? And the challenge is, is the guys that are tasked with that piece generally haven't written the original code. And so how are they supposed to know what file system access, what calls it can make, what network connections can be open, right? That's something that becomes a humanly impossible task as we scale, right? for every single application, for every single release, how do we have a security model that matches that particular package? Um, security is also shifting left into the hands of developer. I kind of introduced that concept already. Um, with that, developers want to know, hey, if you're going to tell me no, fine, but tell me no early and s so that I don't get the nasty gram and I don't delay the project because there's some vulnerability in there. Let me know as early as possible and give me the tools to go do that and give me um, visibility so that I know what is humanly actionable of this massive list of things, right? So I need to have a relevant score around that as well. And then security also needs to be portable. The reality of most organizations that we work with is they have a minimum of two platforms, 
right? There's going to be something legacy, especially in enterprise, on-prem, VM-based, uh, you know, Linux host, maybe Red Hat, maybe it's a platform as a service, OpenShift, maybe it's PCF, maybe it's one of the others, right? Pick your flavor, right? And there's a lot of them out there. There's also another ecosystem inside that same company that's all AWS, Azure, Google-based, right? And these two worlds have different CI CD pipelines, they have different deployment methods, one's using Kubernetes, the other one's using you know, something else that's homegrown, and this can be a thing. The challenge with security models is that I'm creating a security model once in the context of Azure or Google, and then that doesn't necessarily translate one-to-one -one in the context of my other environment. That means a lot of manual configuration, and then I see drift across the expectations and deployments and imp implementations of security across those two environments. So, you know, the other thing is that there's kind of this east-west thinking about security, right? And this is your whole CI, CD thing. And then you've got this whole runtime, northbound, southbound. A lot of, a lot of the traditional security solutions are focused on things like on, this, on this access, right? Or, hey, you know, I'm going to scan. I'm going to, you know, throw an exception to a developer. There's a vulnerability. And then this other set of things over here has said, okay, well, you know, we're going to firewall and we're going to create manual rules and we're going to do this and that. The problem, either coming from both of those worlds, either as a new solution or an old solution, is these two models don't talk together. This is some of the things that we think about differently, is how do we get the correlation between these two worlds? So, a little bit about a customer. Um, so we, um, the customer we worked with was an environmental science and engineering company. Um, basically, they had a whole bunch of old legacy applications. Um, this particular application, millions of lines of code. With that, they had um, all the traditional challenges that you would face in the context of an old application, long deployment cycles, you know, not necessarily an effective way to do things like DR, governmental, and compliance, which was particularly important for this particular client because it's a bit of a moving target, right? I have a product or a solution. It's got a big tail of development. But the challenge is, is that the political landscape is changing. And then the implementation of that, um, and you can argue the validity of this, is you've got guys that are inter interpreting law that have never touched a line of code, don't know how a server operates, don't know how software operates. And they're trying to enforce these policies. But regardless of that, you still have to prove back and audit all that stuff, right? So it becomes a huge challenge and blocker for organizations. This organization um, basically said, hey, you know, we aren't going to kid ourselves into thinking that we can decompose this application into 12-factor app, make it massively infinite scalable um, with our magic wand. What we're going to do is we're going to pack it in a container. It's going to be a fat container. And we're going to see what we get in terms of security um, um, benefits. And those were around vulnerability management. Part of that comes into lifecycle management, patch management. If we are taking an application and we have a vulnerability in this and it's across our estate, then we know our, our a proportionate risk is right our time to exposure times the prevalence in our estate, right? So if you're able to patch faster, you get a benefit, right? Compliance, um, being able to um, take policies and implement them, and then threat protection. Um, so what we do and what we help this client do, um, and I think that what's special about um, the way Twistlock thinks about this, is we've already, you know, we understand containers are minimal, right? We can do things with second profiles to go enhance the security of our application. You know, we have this concept of declarative programming in how we write our apps, but what about our security models, right? Um, and this is the, the, you know, the thing I would emphasize is it's not enough to do a static scan, right? We also need to understand the runtime behavior and be able to correlate those models in a way that's actionable and if we do that correctly, and we do some smart things in the background with math and machine learning and AI, um, what we can do is, is have a runtime whitelist model that describes exactly how our application is supposed to work all the way down to the syscall level, right? So we don't have to worry about going in, building a security runbook model, because guess what? Containers um, and declarative programming gives us a way to go template that. And if we can read it in a programmatic way, then computers can read it too, and they can tend to scale at a lot uh, higher rate than our human brains, right? So what this pre presents is now not only do we have a declarative format for deployment of our application, we also have a model that's created every time we go run that application that's learned by machines that we can go enforce in the context of our runtime environment. 
And with that, we have all the benefits of detailed granularity about specific things that an application should or should not be doing, right? Hey, is this application allowed to run Netcat? Um, you know, should I be listening on these ports? What if a new port exposes? Well, what we have is now a whitelist model versus going and saying everything you can't, everything from the past is blacklisted, it can't do that. Now we go to a whitelist model that focuses on, um, on throwing exceptions and notifying, blocking uh, that behavior um, and giving you detailed remediation steps back to, you know, the appropriate developer of, uh, of responsibility, right? So vulnerability management, real quick. Um, there's a lot of ways. Um, this particular client, and I think it's like a lot of them, they were using some open source tools. They were using some proprietary tools as they're scanning particular layers um, of their application, but not the full stack. It didn't necessarily factor in the infrastructure pieces. You know, ops did not necessarily get the same visibility from those scans. And then those were kind of point in time things that didn't necessarily follow an application through its life cycle. You know, as they moved into the modern world, they were able to take daily feeds of information, aggregate 30 sources. Um, with that, they were also able to reduce the number of false positives. Um, and then also um, implement some software infrastructure checks that, that allowed them to, to uh, further their automation. Um, from the compliance side, this was kind of an ops-owned activity. Once again, it didn't really make sense for an operations team to try to understand and interpret you know, these policies. Yes, there's elements of that, but if we can build that earlier into the software development process and, and provide some ownership um, with the software teams, you know, we can do things like make sure that, you know, a container's not running as root, right? That's a basic benchmark setting. If you look at NIST or any of the other major um, white papers in this regard, that's going to be a big no-no, right? If we can go flag that type of behavior or see that secrets are being injected in, or, or being uh, described in clear text, you know, we can flag that early on in the process and make sure that as we go down the pipeline, those don't rear their ugly head. And then in threat protection, you know, same story, right? We have a customer, they've looked at things in, in um, you know, the traditional model in security, right? Oh, I'm going to hire a pen tester. Well, the problem is, is a pen tester comes in, you know, once a year. They provide some information about a software release, and then you're going to do a weekly deploy, right? Well, that information is instantly out of date. So it creates a problem for organizations. Uh, by moving over into the new model and having a whitelist approach, they were able to actually not only do that on a daily basis and do that on a per deploy basis, but then also throw some really detailed feedback to the, the appropriate people in oper uh, operations and development that, uh, that needed to deal with it. So um, a little bit about that. Um, you know, in terms of what does it look like, it's pretty simple, right? Um, not groundbreaking, um, but, but really obvious as we think about kind of this blacklist versus whitelist world. You know, what we're doing is we're taking 30 plus feeds, taking a research team, aggregate that, that into something that's manageable, piping that into a tool that's installed in the context of your Docker environment of choice, completely agnostic, and basically providing a tool that's completely um, allows you to um, assign policy and then uh, the capabilities to defend and block that in your runtime. Obviously, a big component of this is this needs to be something that integrates with all your existing tools. Um, we know everyone's already done CI. We know you've already invested in the platform as a service or EKS or whatever it might be to go run your containers. And so you need to integrate. Um, and that feedback needs to go to the appropriate teams. So um, at a high level, you know, there's some inherent security benefits, right? We all know about the benefits that come with automation, patching management. But really, what we think the fundamental change needs to be is, is thinking about moving towards an iterative approach and a whitelist approach versus a blacklist approach. Um, that's something that allows your model to iterate at the rate of your software development and, and is really unlocking a lot of success for our clients. So that's a little bit about how we see the world in security, how we see things um, changing, what we've done with one particular client um, that was using um, you know, had, had the legacy tail that they had to deal with. Um, but I can uh, pause there and open up for questions and, um, yeah. <laughs> Any questions?
No questions. All right. Well, if there are no questions, um, I'll be around for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, feel free to come over. Um, you know, one of the things we're passionate about is understanding, um, yeah, I, what you're thinking about doing with security, what you already have. Um, if any of these ideas or philosophies make sense in the way that you're thinking about developing uh, pipelines or protecting your code uh, or assuring compliance, you know, we can work with you on that. Um, my information details are on the slide. Uh, you can also hit us up um, or get a direct line in to our development team um, via Twistlock Labs and Twistlock Team. Those are our Twitter feeds. Thanks.